Good evening. My name is Oliver Holt, and I'm here with Julio Enriquez, and we'd both like to welcome you to our botanical beverage class. Now, Julio and I are both uh, Blue Hill bartenders, bartenders at restaurants that are connected to stone barns, and that gives us a very unique um, vantage point for approaching cocktails, something that we think that you may find interesting uh, in that it's very ingredient uh, oriented, as opposed to focusing on the complexity or, or how many th different things we can put into a cocktail. We like to start with one ingredient, one ingredient that we're very excited about and see how we can best draw out the interest and attention in that ingredient. Now, before we begin, it's really important that everyone at home, as many of you as possible, has a drink in your hand because we're going to be making some drinks here. One of them will be alcoholic, one of them will be non-alcoholic, so everybody wins. But it's important that you have something in your hand. I, I'll introduce myself first and then I'll let Julio talk. Uh, as I said, I'm Oliver. I've been working at Blue Hill for five years now. I was working down at Blue Hill, New York, started in 2015 when actually this gentleman to my left here trained me in the kitchen. Uh, and it was there that we got to uh, observe the, the, the chefs yeah. and see the way that they would uh, approach each particular ingredient and the sort of zen-like attention that they would pay to it. And that was something that definitely influenced us. I started bartending a couple of years later. Julio, uh, I think, was inspired by me and started about a year after that. But I'll let him. You weren't uh, supposed to tell anyone. I'll let him confirm that. <laughs> Go ahead, Julio. Uh, so my name is Julio Enriquez, uh, and I've been bartending uh, at Blue Hill Stone Barns for about four years now. Um, but I've been with the company for a little longer than that, you can say. <laughs> Um, but like Oliver said, we yes, we do focus on uh, one ingredient uh, coming from the farm or uh, a technique being used in the kitchen. And we try to focus on that and highlight that um, particular ingredient and or technique in a cocktail uh, just to kind of drive home what we're doing on the farm and in the kitchen to the bar, because that is the first thing that someone, uh, you know, has a sip on sip of uh, at the bar uh, as they get welcomed. So really focusing on chef and farmers uh, rather than focusing on ourselves, for sure. Um, I think we should start presenting the cocktail uh, and our main ingredient that we're gonna be focusing on today is parsnip. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have one for display, um, but I'm sure everyone here knows exactly what a parsnip <laughs> looks like. Um, so what we did with this parsnip, uh, you can go a million ways about this, uh, but what we tried to focus on is um, we had Chef Dan cooking a, a parsnip, roasting the parsnip in the oven. Um, and while I was walking by, um, I did sense uh, this, this aroma, this beautiful uh, floral yet um, lightly earthy aroma. And uh, I was like, well, we have to make a cocktail out of this. And immediately I thought um, an agave based spirit. Uh, personally, I love mezcal. Um, I don't know how you feel about that. I, I think we're in the same boat. Yeah, for sure. uh, but tequila can be used as well, just to complement that earthy quality to it. Um, but what I did is um, I did a, uh, a, a cook, a double cook, uh, one being a wrapped in foil parsnip and cooking it in the oven, kind of like Chef Dan would do. Just to roast it. Yeah, exactly. Just to caramelize all these flavors. Um, Get and the then, sugar in. Correct, yeah. correct, correct. Um, so I would, if you're doing it at home, I would cook it at 350 degrees, and depending on the size of the parsnip, somewhere around the lines of an hour and a half to two and a half hours. Sure. Um, so after that is cooked, then you, you chop that up, you infuse it into a spirit, um, mezcal, uh, just, in a, just about like, a, what, four to five hours, but the longer it goes, the more flavor you're gonna get. Uh, you could put this in a sous vide bag, you could put it in a, in a, in a mason jar, uh, anything that is a sealed container just to really preserve all that alcohol. Um, once that is ready, uh, you could take uh, all the pieces that were left over uh, from the infusion and you're going to make a syrup out of that. How you say? I do. I, I will tell you. Yes. <laughs> uh, so we're making a caramel syrup um, and I actually have these displayed right here. This is the infusion after the infusion process and this is the parsnip caramel. So we're taking about uh, let's say a quart of sugar um, and a quarter cup of water. Uh, and then we're going to bring the sugar to a boil. Uh, when it gets to a boil and you see it browning a little bit, we're adding all those pieces, those wasted pieces of infusion 
of parsnip into that boil to cook even further and to release all those juices. Uh, once that is completely cooked over and roasted, um, we're going to add more water to bring it down to a syrup consistency. Right. Right. And then it's just going to have a ton of very floral parsnip flavor, but with that sweetness of the caramel. So uh, I'm going to make the cocktail. Right. So if it's all right with you, I'm just going to sort of give a, a cliff notes version of, please, of what please, you've done. Please, please, please. So you've taken the parsnip, right. you've, you've cleaned it, you've roasted it, right. then you've infused it into the mezcal, which is this larger bottle, right? That, so this is the this, mezcal. This is the mezcal that I actually prefer. Right. Um, agave okay, de Cortes. Yes. Beautiful, very approachable mezcal. Super grassy. Oh, yeah. It's like, yeah, yeah. really nice for root veg. And then, so that larger bottle that, I mean, to me, could be like lemon juice or something, that's the infused spirit. That's the. the correct, correct. Cool. So once you let that sit, and this has been sitting in a bag for about, I want to say like three days. Right. So it's had a long time to sort of. Yeah, extract. to extract everything, everything. So it takes on a lot of the color of that parsnip. Um, now, you're going to have a little bit of sediment. Mm -hmm. It's just, you can be just decanted away, yeah. yeah. So the cool thing about um, making infusions with alcohol is that alcohol is a natural solvent. It draws Correct. the, uh, it draws the sort of, um, through osmotic pressure, it draws the, 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 the interior of the cells of whatever you're infusing essence it with. Of, yeah, yeah, what so the that flavor you, is. So that you can, and it'll take on the flavor of whatever you put in it. Yeah, totally. Um, I actually, when I was in, uh, when I was in college, I was at a party and, and uh, someone said- Tequila oh, shots? It was a tequila shot, <laughs> but a friend of mine said, oh, I brought bacon vodka to the party. I thought, what a very unusual, uh, yeah. you know, what, I didn't realize that they were making bacon vodka. And she pulled out a plastic water bottle and it was filled with vodka with a rash of bacon stuck Stop in there. Stop it. Thankfully it was fully cooked, but uh, you know, huh. it, uh, and it tasted just like bacon. So just, you know. So this should really inspire bacon, everyone at home to do whatever they want. Shot of bacon vodka, that's it, that's what you took? Well, yeah, I mean, it would have been delicious in a Bloody Mary, but we, did, we didn't have everything on hand at the time. So uh, so someone's asking, what is the name of the, uh, uh, what is the name of the mezcal? Uh, agave de Cortes. And we're, we're going to have, uh, uh, that we were, go we're going to have the recipes and the list of all the ingredients available to everyone up to the- Yeah, absolutely. At the end of the class, we can have that jotted down for you. Yeah, absolutely. make it home. Um, so you have the infused, uh, you have the infused mezcal there, and then next to it is a caramel syrup correct. that you made with the pieces of parsnip that you had taken correct, out correct. of. Correct. So the... they still have flavor. Right. Um, but why just throw away and not use them again? I mean, if you can't now, use it, sure. If you want to enhance even further, you can use raw parsnip. Mm. But I like to use those, those wasted pieces just For to sure. like you know yeah. get something more out of it. Um, and once that's over, you can actually dehydrate them as well and do like these nice little funky like uh, parsnip uh, candy. Oh, like little crisps and stuff. Yeah, like that. yeah. That's super cool. Just okay. garnish so it what kind top. of cocktail are you making? So I'm essentially making a margarita. Right. Yeah, it's a, a template on margarita with just an added uh, touch of green tea just to brighten everything up. Cool. Um, let me start that so please you can do. try because I would like you to try I'd like a cocktail. I'd like to taste it, please. Uh, so we're going to do a, a half an ounce of uh, Essentia green tea. Okay. So how do you characterize Sencha green tea? That's more of like Sencha a green fresh, tea is gonna be, springy yeah, sort of fresh, tea, right? grassy, yeah. springy, very close to like almost its vegetal quality that matcha has, but right. not as aggressive. Okay, cool. Yeah. Doing a half an ounce of the parsnip caramel syrup. I'm gonna do three quarters of an ounce of lemon juice. And you ask, well, that's not a margarita Doesn't because right. margarita is a uh, lime juice. It has to be. Yeah. But in order to uh, not distract that beautiful aroma and flavor that parsnip has, uh, lemon tends to be a little more neutral than uh, a traditional lime juice. Where lime, lime juice has be like, a lot of, like, uh, it has a lot of personality. Correct, yeah, correct. No. That's a very nice way to put it, actually. <laughs> it definitely is present at a party. For sure. So three quarters of an ounce of uh, lemon juice, and then we're gonna finish it off with two ounces of this syrup. Now, also, if you wanted to, and uh, you can do anything uh, you'd like at home, but if you finish off this uh, beautiful uh, infusion, you could drink this on its own. Maybe a touch of bitters and make like a mezcal parsnip old fashioned. Um, I personally love that, mm. just on its own. And it has all the characteristics of the parsnip. Yeah, the sweetness of the pasta definitely sort of oh, comes yeah. through on the and nose. And then the smokiness of the mezcal still right there. Right on the finish, yeah, it's super just cool. Just vegetal all the way. Yeah. Um, now I'm gonna add a little bit of salt. Uh, you could salt the rim. I just like to add a touch in there. Nice. Um, not to overwhelm, you know, the palate of, uh, with salt. But 
you can garnish it as a rim if you'd like. Give it a look. And now you could double strain this. Personally, I like those little bit of chips of ice yeah, sure. that are like that you bite into when you're sipping the drink yeah, yeah, and it like it, Yeah, totally, yeah. totally. Oh, that looks lovely. If you want to garnish it with a little something, because <laughs> why not? Yeah, of course. Oh, that's beautiful. Here you are, sir. Okay, well, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Cross my fingers here. Hope you like so, it. This is a parsnip mezcal margarita. Parsnip mezcal margarita. Variation. Mm. Now, the green tea is lovely in that. It, it provides a really great sort of foundation on that. Totally, thank you. Now, is that something that, I mean, what do you think is the, is the, the role that tea plays in a, in a, in a, in a cocktail? Is it That's a, kind a of very good question. Um, so obviously dilution. Right. But rather than using a water to dilute, like rather than over shaking it, in my mind, it's like you're diluting, but you're also adding flavor. You're also adding something to tie everything together right uh, i've tried it without the tea just to see you know if it would work sure and the the, the essential tea just it, it brings everything all those lovely like i said vegetal notes right um but not like eating like a cooked beet you know which is like to me it's like a sound wave almost so like a cooked beet would be like down here like a mm -hmm. base very while okay. like a parsnip is like very high like almost like a i don't know you're a a music I got you. I'm sorry, yeah. like it's, a trumpet almost. Sure. Or, or to put it in more like uh, in more cocktail perspective, like oh. parsnip is, has those like higher notes, those like ginny sort of qualities, whereas beets are like, yeah, I think actually we may it's disagree more... on this because you you like parsnip with um, with agave spirits. But I, I think parsnip and, and whiskey goes. Really I, well I say if you have gin in your back bar and you have vodka, you yeah. know, I personally don't like using vodka. But use, you know, anything. One thing have. that vodka is great for is that it's it's a blank canvas and will take on the flavor right. of anything that you put in there, which is really great if you're trying to sort of beat someone over the head with the, oh, with totally. the flavor of this one. I, I would agree with that. Um, and I like using vodka, for example, in like a, like if you would infuse a flower. Sure. Or yeah, something uh, where you don't want any spice. competition whatsoever. Right. You yeah. want to really see what that ingredient brings out. You use a neutral grain spirit yeah. for no distractions. That's and then great. you work from there. So the, our approach to cocktails, as, as, as you may have noticed, it, it's not particularly complicated. We're not trying to think of what, uh, what is the most, um, you know, what's, what's the most, you know, cool and interesting thing that we can do uh, to these ingredients. It's how can we bring out the flavor of these ingredients. Yeah. Flavor um, and, you know, also focusing on how can we tell the chef's stories exactly, at the yeah. bar. What I like about our approach is that it's the kind of thing that people can do at home. Um, you know, the, 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 the techniques that, that um, Julio just went over, they're not complicated. They're something that really anyone can do. Um, and especially, you know, someone that, something that someone who has an appreciation for these ingredients would also appreciate the process. Um, I'm going to make a non-alcoholic cocktail. And the reason for that is that there is a, uh, somewhere along the way, uh, people got under the impression that, or rather cocktail bars got under the impression that alcoholic cocktails are going to be interesting and dynamic and non-alcoholic cocktails are going to be boring. Like a Pepsi. Or exactly. Sprite, yeah. Or a juice, you know, a fruit juice. Or, or it'll oh, be some just, sort of sour variation like or something no like that. dimensional kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go with something that, no, so there's really no reason for that. Uh, basically the only thing, uh, you know, the, uh, a, a non-alcoholic cocktail should be just as delicious as, um, it's all it's counterpart that has alcohol in it and what I'm going to make right now Would be very delicious with some whiskey in it or something like that, but it's equally delicious by itself And I'm going to make a tea um, would out of in be delicious with whiskey. I mean most things <laughs> would certainly uh, Now a tea Is a very specific thing. It's a hot brewed beverage made out of tea leaves This is really more of an infusion in the same way that a mint tea is an infusion or a um, 
chamomile uh, tea is an infusion. So we're thinking more like tisane style. Exactly, yeah. And this is something that, I, that I'm that i really just making out of things that, that most people just have at home, uh, the kind of thing that you don't necessarily need to go out and buy something fancy to enjoy uh, a, a delicious beverage by yourself. And I basically just raided the uh, pastry department uh, of all of the- I saw him do it. Of all of the spices that we have right now. We have a lot of baking spices. We're really sort of leaning into seasonality here. And I'm sort of just going to play jazz here. I'm going to put some- Oh, off the cuff, huh? A little bit of cinnamon in here and a star anise pod, or rather a whole star. Um, would you tend to break it up or just it's I would, but since I'm going to be pouring hot water over yeah. this, there's really no need to. I've got okay. an allspice berry in here. Um, I don't necessarily think that people would have a ton of uh, pink peppercorns, but I'm going to put a couple in here. And then this is the one thing that I'm excited about, something that uh, it's really cool to be working at a place like this, something to have on hand. This is sassafras. Um, this is a, a, a medicinal herb that's been used for medicine and, uh, and, and soft beverages in the past. It has this really lovely floral yet spicy aroma. Somehow it sort of uh, lives in both worlds. It has um, a lot of texture to it too, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a really, really fabulous ingredient that we've been working on for our botanical beverage program and something that I'm really excited about. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's really just as simple as adding these ingredients and pouring hot water of it, over it. There's really nothing more, uh, nothing more fancy than that. And I'm gonna need to give this some time to steep. So I suppose we can talk more about other unusual ingredients that you like to use. Uh, and I think we could both talk about that. Um, <laughs> uh, in terms of like, what would you do for like, you know, now we're, we're in the essentially winter, like how hard is it to forge for ingredients uh, now during this time? I mean, it's not um, hard at all. You just need to know, you just to, need to, to be with for. someone who, who knows what they're doing. And that's why we have such a really unique opportunity yeah. to be working at a place like Stone Barns is that we can just go out to the, uh, we can just go out to, you know, to the, to the farm and uh, you go up to someone who's working in the fields like, hey, what's good right now? What cannot kill me? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and there are some things like, well, this will kind of kill you, but yeah. I mean, you'll be okay. You as know, long as you don't, bad. you know, excess, uh, ex use excess amounts of it, you'll be exactly, fine. Exactly, yeah. Um, and it also is, a, is ben beneficial for us that they have a, a greenhouse, right? For sure, yeah. Um, now turmeric is, is alive and well. Um, What's the most interesting ingredient that you use either from the greenhouse or from uh, the farm? So at Stormlands, we, I mean, the, 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 obviously the, the rhizome program is, or rather the, the rhizomes are really impressive. Yeah. Having both access to fresh ginger and fresh turmeric is something yeah, that's really I mean, cool. And also, um, you know, if you were to buy that at the soup, at the supermarket, I mean, you wouldn't get turmeric. <laughs> but, but, but you could, but, you can, but not as good as. Yeah, if you, if you go to the farmer's market, get the very best yes, that you can, that's, that's you amazing. still wouldn't have access to the entire plant. You'd really just have the, the rhizomes, correct, which is, correct. you know, oftentimes when we think about, uh, you know, when, you know, I, I remember when I was first working at Blue Hill and I was trying to think about the context of all, you know, being able to give these spiels about these vegetables. You, right. you, just, you have to think about, um, you know, you think about like the broccoli as, one as 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 a, a self-contained plant, but it's right. a part of the plant. It's like looking at an, at uh, uh, you know at the trunk of an elephant. Right. Like, so oh, so what you're getting at is using an ingredient from nose to tail, essentially. Exactly. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, definitely a combination of the sort of you know, there's definitely a, I suppose a culmination of the farm to table oh, ideology. I mean, that's I mean, it's, it's a it's a great theme. I mean, especially when you said uh, turmeric. Because you can use the, the you know the, the rhizomes, you can use the leaves. The leaves the have turmeric leaves are amazing. Yeah, it's they have such so a cool much, uh, flavor, flavor. Yeah. Um, and it's vegetal. Yeah, but kind of like to... curried as well has this like yeah, spicy totally, sort of quality totally. to it. It's, it's, I, so I you would you. say I don't know if I got an answer from you. Which is the most? Yeah. I, I mean, turmeric leaves were sort of the biggest, my most exciting uh, discovery from this year. That's something that I was really, really, you know, really psyched about, um, and and something that um, you know I, I'm very excited to to have been able to use. Um, so this was the, this is, these are actually with the sassafras, or you have a question, what is that, the sassafras root or the uh, dried leaf? These are the twigs of the sassafras, yeah. uh, of the sassafras plant, plant. I mean, basically in the same way that you can tap um, syrup or sap from a maple tree without stressing it too much, you can uh, take uh, some of the, you know, some of the woods, which is why we are not suggesting that anyone should go out to the woods and try to harvest their own hickory or sassafras. Let, yeah, we, we need an adult. To yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely, you know, uh, uh, you want some supervision for that. Um, somebody's asking, what was the third berry that you used? Um, I used... The pink peppercorn? I used cinnamon, star anise, allspice and pink peppercorn to make uh, my sort of spiced infusion. 
needs a little bit more time. Yeah. Um, and on my end, I, I feel like there's a lot of really cool ingredients um, uh, on the farm. Right. Uh, but to me, and nothing against the farm, but I guess it technically is a farm ingredient. Um, and the weirdest one and the most interesting one is tallow. Right. Um, rendered beef fat uh, that can More provide nose to tail sort of. Yeah, right. correct. And just because you said, you know, the bacon vodka, it just reminded yeah. me. Of <laughs> I'm glad that that still continues to inspire people. To yeah, I mean, it's it's a great story. Yeah. <laughs> I never knew that about you. College, you're so sophisticated. Yeah, you don't want to know much more. <laughs> but yeah, but let's let's go back on to, to tallow, and I don't yeah, so, so focusing on that. <laughs> uh, no, so tallow just really provides like, a, and it's like you're not even using the actual tallow. You're you're essentially fat washing it, which you're cooking it into a spirit, yeah. letting that turn into a liquid, and then freezing it to harden so it could easily separate, separate and then just it gives it a beautiful aroma and texture yeah. it's just like it, the the weight you could feel it on your palate it just drops and then just a matter of using the proper ingredient after that i've used parsnip in the past i've mm. used uh beets in the past yeah uh sure. celery root could be cool but it really is a, a cool ingredient to use to reinforce something during the winter season right so you're saying that the approach that you had sort of with the pasta can be used with in many, pretty much any root vegetable. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. We've had a lot of success with carrots. Uh, you know, I mean, carrots are a great... Really? I, I but have this, but so not roasted much carrots. trouble with carrots. With carrots, you want to use fresh uh, carrots because as soon as you roast them, they turn into this, like, it's a very different flavor. It doesn't have that same snap as when it's uh, as well, when see, fresh. With me, I've used... I used fresh carrots, right. whole, and I couldn't get as much flavor. And I've used them... Um, in a juice format and it separates you don't you just yeah eat it i hate it using fr like fruit juices yeah, like, you have to clean the juices uh, the whole time which no one likes to do no. and then you know it has a like, shelf life of like one day i was wondering maybe like if i clarified it in a way but yeah, yeah. then i tried cooking it and then when you cook it you do remove all the solids but sure, like sure. you said it just changes the flavor completely yeah absolutely. so i mean yeah it's just a, it, honestly like between myself and him i don't know if you've done it and i'm, I'm sure you have but Failing is part of the process. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, after you do it wrong one time, you can typically figure out how to do it right every single time. Two, after three, that. maybe yeah. four times you get it right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but you learn from it. You really do. So we have a question. Have either of us used a brassica in a cocktail? Which is yes, a great yes question. Yes and no. Yes I and have no. tried to use a brassica in a cocktail. I've uh, failed many times miserably. Yeah, um, yeah, it just, I mean, I, there's really no better way. It just, you get this horrible, like, <laughs> flatulence kind of aroma from it there's like no you know i mean i, I think that's a great and arugula gimlet is definitely a great way to do yeah. it but you know i mean for a brassica you know, I've, I've tried to do i've tried cabbages i've tried brussels sprouts. kale i've done we've never done kale you I know i've that. only seen it one way where it didn't come out like that funky kind of yeah, character yeah, yeah. is if you take the kale you dehydrate it right and then you infuse it okay cool yeah i don't know it's so a weird i'm not a scientist but there's a weird chemical compound that is lost to when you dehydrate yeah, those yeah. Uh, things but that's the only thing i've tried uh because i've done other things like radish you ever tried sure. muddle radish in a cocktail yeah but it's so hard that it's it's very that'll, difficult that'll to, clear a room sort of thing. yeah absolutely yeah i mean one of the cool things that you know having the connection to the kitchen is that they have so many different projects going yeah. on at any time that they'll have some sort of like uh you know they'll have like a fermented cabbage juice or something like that which is like not the kind of thing you know it's so out there that you can't really put it on the signature menu and have people you know order it off it all the time yeah. but if someone's like why don't you surprise me you're like i guarantee you are not expecting it so, <laughs> um i think this had enough time to infuse i'm gonna ask for your um oh yes please uh for this is your parsnip caramel syrup that is correct uh, and you, obviously you don't need to use a parsnip caramel syrup i mean i'm really just looking for any sort of sweetness so this could be uh um, honey, this could be maple syrup, this could be, you know, I would, you know, I would probably stay away from white sugar, but just because it doesn't have enough characteristic other than just being sweet. But uh, I mean, it would be great with brown sugar. This is sugar. adorable, I gotta say. Isn't it nice? Have the even this right? Okay. Hang on. All right. So after your very exciting and fortifying uh, cocktail, we're gonna have something civilized, a nice cup of tea. <laughs> And this is, a, I mean, this is kind of like a, I don't know, I guess like a virgin hot toddy kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, and my favorite, it's one of my favorite garnishes of all time. Uh, even when I'm making cocktails at home and I've got a twist of something, I like to give it a little haircut because I really do think that when it looks nice, 
it tastes nice too. I strongly, strongly believe that. And then I like to just get a little clove I'm here. use that for sure. Get a little clove. Look at you. Yeah, this looks nice. Wait a minute. I've got like a little sort of clove ring here. And then that's for me. That's okay. It's okay. You can go first. I'll make one for you as well. <laughs> You've earned it. And really quick, just to step back, um, have you ever had like chefs go up to the bar and just give you a random thing? That's my absolute favorite thing about right? working at Blue Hill is or, or sort of when our forager would come in, you know, yes. after after sort of, you know, ferrying vegetables to and from stone barns, they'd come into Blue Hill, New York on the last stop of the day with a bag full of marigolds or, you know, like, hey, I ripped this borage out of the ground. <laughs> you want to do something cool with it? Um, yeah, I absolutely love that. You know, like, like he was saying, we're very fortunate to work at a place like this where we're surrounded not only by beautiful and wonderful ingredients, but also by very talented individuals. Yeah, I couldn't uh, agree more. You know, being in the farm or you know, in the kitchen. It's very uncivilized to cheers with a cup of tea. But so why are we doing it? I, I, I think that, you know, <laughs> I appreciate I, I'm willing to make an exception this time around. Mm. Mm. That is soothing. Yeah, and it's just the kind of, I mean, again, these are all things that, that I mean, other than the, um, other than the, uh, the pink peppercorns and the sassafras, these are all things that, you know, people could do at home, I, I, I believe. Calvados in here, that's... So, I mean, yeah, it would be delicious with some sort of, uh, 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 you know, brown spirit, I think would be very tasty, but, you know, definitely not, not necessary. Uh, but a virtual cocktail. Yeah, the, um, we have a lot of fun here. Um, so, so I, yeah, I mean, I guess at this, at this point we can sort of, you know, if anyone has any sort of general bartending questions or, yeah. so, or questions about our, you know, approach, you know, I, 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 I'd love to hear if people have. Maybe you could sing a little bit. I, I could, but I'd really rather He's not. A very um, good singer. I, 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 I would also like to know if people have similar approaches to, to making cocktails that, that we do, because um, it's, you know, I, again, I, I don't think that we're trying to go from, uh, we're not we're not going again we're not going for complexity here we're, we're going for singularity in in, in an aspect so um, for, for, if you want to if you want to sort of go over again how you make the the caramel i was going to say for colin hart i can just um give them the uh the process the you know uh, everything that they have to do to, to make the infusion the part the uh the parsnip syrup um and i could send it can we send it to them is that a thing yeah but we i'm sure they'd also like to hear the, oh, the process now um so we're taking a quart of uh sugar i know you don't like to use sugar i'm sorry but it's all right how do you make caramel man uh so let's just pretend for a second that this is your pot you're taking obviously of course it's not going to fit in here but uh just bear with me uh somebody just said papa and i love you for that that's great we'll talk about that yeah, yeah, yeah. that's next <laughs> a quart of uh sugar into the pot put it at high heat but uh about a quarter of that quart so what is that eight ounces a quarter of a quart yeah a half pint half pint yeah so you put that in and then what i didn't say is, which is one cup yeah just how many ounces four no Eight. Eight. <laughs> got him. Sorry. <laughs> I totally got him. Um, but uh, let's just grab a quart, fill the water uh, about a quarter of the way, put it in, uh, and then you fill it up three quarters of the way to make your full quart, and you put that on the side, the three quarters of a quart. Of more water? Correct. But okay. you're putting it on the side. Right. Because that's going to be your dilution okay. after the fact. Okay. So you take that, uh, you bring it to a boil, but before you do that, you're adding just a little bit of vinegar, of champagne vinegar. And uh, that'll prevent the crystallizations of the sugar. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's yeah. key. Yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't say that, though. That was my secret. That's right. We're here now. It's worth knowing. <laughs> um, you stir it around. You make sure it, bring, it comes to a boil. It'll start changing colors. And you can go as dark as you want. I like to stay on the lighter end of the caramel coloring uh, just to let the parsnip color really come through. If not, it's going to be really dark. Super dark, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we get it to the right color that we want. Then we add either the raw parsnip you could do for that quart, one large parsnip is fine. Mm -hmm. um, or you can get all the byproduct from the infusion process and put it in. Right. You let that cook for five, 10 minutes. If it's a raw parsnip, you let that get to a, a nice golden color. Uh, and then- is, is that a good way of knowing when you've done, when yes. you've cooked it enough, is if it goes from raw parsnip to-, to a, like a Exactly, cooked parsnip. Okay, exactly, cool. exactly. And then when you get to that point, you start dropping the heat. Yeah. Uh, and then you're gonna be adding this water back into um, the pot. 
to get it to a nice syrup consistency. Now I do have to say, mm. you have to be very careful because caramel is very, Super. very hot. Yeah. Um, I learned that the hard way. Do you have to wait for it to cool before adding the, uh, the sugar? Just, because it does it, you know, it doesn't explode. You have to anything, wait though. before, just wait a little bit. Let the temperature go down before you add the water. Yeah. Because it tends to like really burst. Up. Yeah, yeah. And just, just be careful on that part. But that is the most uh, difficult, dangerous part, I promise. And the reason that he's diluting it in the first place is because for it to evenly distribute throughout the, um, the cocktail, throughout the cocktail yeah. you want it to be a, a, a watery, liquidy consistency. Right. And if I'm going to put it in this shaker, uh, sorry, oh, this uh, speed pourer as well, it's like in order to get it out, we have to get it to a consistency like exactly. that. If not, it's like yeah. going to be the most difficult thing. And you know, proper incorporation of the uh, syrup. But if, but if you were doing, for example, this tea that I made, if you eat just a little bit of that caramel at the bottom would, add, and then stirring it in would be a perfectly good yeah. way to do it. And if you have the caramel itself, you can definitely surprise and impress your friends with your Boy, vegetal caramel. A lot of questions here. Now we had, so we'll start with someone uh, asking if we've worked with pawpaws before in cocktails. Now here is my personal experience is, oh. no, I haven't because whenever uh, our forager is able to get his hands on pawpaws, <laughs> they all go to stone buns and I don't get to use any of them, which uh, I'm slightly bitter about, but they're, they're a really fabulous ingredient. Uh, for those that don't know, they're called, they're also known as like the Western mango, I think is, is or I don't yeah, know if it's Western that. mango, but they're, they're, uh, they're uh, flavor wise, what would you say? It it's like, like it's like a mango and a banana together. It's yes. yeah, that's exactly what it tastes it's like. Exact, you know, it has the consistency on. of a mango and that, that just, it's amazing, especially because like, you know, if you go down to, to Central America and you have a mango there, and then you come up here and you have mango, it's just not, I mean, like you may as well not be, eat a mango here at all. Oh. But the papa being a, a seasonal and a, and a, a, a you know, a, a local uh, fruit, it, you get all of that subtlety. I mean, as soon as it's, it's freshly picked and you get like all of those like floral characteristics and it's like the perfect ripeness, it's great. It's a, it's a really great ingredient. Um, I personally love it because I get so much of it. <laughs> Uh, no, but I also do uh, love it because it's it's actually very close to uh, one of the fruits that comes from uh, my country, Peru. Um, since it is a custard fruit, uh, it's related to the chirimoya. I don't, I'm not yeah, familiar. Chirimoya, but it, uh, it's a, a white flesh rather than being like a very yellowish mango colored flesh. Cool. Uh, but it, it's very distinct in flavor. Now, I've used it in the past uh, by uh, infusing it as a whole because um, the skins have all the aroma. Yeah. It's just this beautiful, like floral, uh, tropical kind of aroma. Uh, and then you take the inside of it and you can make that into a garnish. Because it's very difficult to work with the inside flesh just because- You've got that huge seed in there that you have to like- Yeah, have and it's a fun fact, if you ever are looking to um, work with pawpaw, uh, everything, the, the inside uh, meat uh, everything close to the wall, the skin is going to be bitter, mm -hmm. and everything closer to the seed will be the sweetest Sweet. part. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I, I, that's, so that's I found that out step. after my fiftieth pop off. <laughs> and then you realize you had to sort of go back and change everything. Yeah. Actually, you yeah. can sort of get get away with it's it. Great, great time. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna read a few questions to see which one if there are any that we can sort of double onto. And they. Oh, that that ingredient is a what? Was that a is that a papaya? The chirimoya? Yeah. No, no, no. Okay, totally different. Totally okay. different. So, pawpaws and cocktails. Oh, using beer in different. Yeah. So, uh, beer in cocktails is a, is a is Andy. Yeah, I mean, definitely, I would sort of lean into. You have to think about like what's going to um, be the the star of the show. You know, is it yeah. going to be the flavor of the beer, or is the beer just going to be a vehicle for whatever? Uh, flavor you want to use. We at Blue Hill, New York, we had a really, really delicious uh, cocktail that was. Um, Badger Flame Beet, that's a golden beet infused um, Old Tom Gin oh, okay. um, with apricot and like a, like an apricot syrup oh. and um, and with Pilsner topping that. And it was just like earthy and refreshing and, and, and it, was, an it was really, really great. That's an interesting set of ingredients. It was great. And, and uh, it was, we called it a spray tan because working, <laughs> working, with the, um, working with the beets, our hands got all red like we've been spraying. That anyway, happened. But yeah, but yeah, so beer is, you know, it's a, it's a great cocktail. To, uh, it's, a bit, it's a great ingredient to use, but it's not the kind of thing where you want to be like, Let's see if I just add some beer to this. What's going to happen? It, 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 I mean, sh go yeah, for it. It depends but... on how much beer you're adding. Exactly. Too, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I would use it like if you're going like, you know, go with strong ingredients already and then um, treat it like a soda. Yeah. So you, that's oh, a you great can, way I mean, of putting it. Yeah. Like, you know, stouts, I would use a small amount of just because they're such a strong flavor that, you know. It yeah. Like with, the I've done like a sweet potato with a stout. Yeah. That was wonderful. Um, but I could totally see a badger flame beat with a nice pilsner. Yeah. It was great. 
Um, so working with shiso, um, I don't have a ton of, uh, I don't have a, a ton of, uh, oh, uh, purple, yeah, I, purple shiso. Yeah. I, so I, we've used, uh, you know, purple shiso. I've, I've sort of, you know, it's, it's, a. Uh, I've made a, 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 an infused syrup with that before that was really delicious, just a regular sugared simple syrup, you know, just because, you know, again, the whole blank canvas kind of thing. And I gave it this, you know, it's still sweet, but it has this sort of like, not necessarily acidic kind of quality to it, but bright, you know, uh, yeah. and, and an amazing color, which works really well. Um, so, you know, I, and, and that's the kind of thing that in, you know, uh, infusing, making an infused syrup is a way that you can do things with both alcoholic and non-alcoholic cocktails. You don't need to, I've, I've done uh, a wonderful like mojito with a shiso. Oh, that sounds delicious. Yeah, but you can't muddle it. Or... Yeah, with rum. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, so good. But you could do it with gin as well. Yeah, yeah. Kind of play in that. We, I think we template. did. We did like a. Te it was either tequila or rum. It was a, a light spirit, and it was uh, the shiso and um, and uh, the brine from uh, the kitchen was making ume, the salted plum. Yeah. So it was like a little bit. It was tequila. It was definitely tequila. So yeah. it's like salted plum <laughs> tequila. Ume syrup, yeah, uh, uh, sweet uh, sour uh, um, kind of thing. Shiso, yeah, shiso syrup. No, yeah, totally. it was delicious. That's amazing. I think we called it was mad scholarship. I think we called it um, around the world or where in the world because it was like so many different you know, sort of. <laughs> it's just like a like a cocktail of culture. Well, that's so well. great. It's like it, it gives you such like a, a a sense of pride by grabbing the things that don't make any sense and putting them together, well, and they actually. And what that was is, I went to the kitchen and I was like, and I said to our chef, I was like, Nick. Oh, I got to put a new, like, the, like the, this is no longer in season. Yeah. What am I going to put on that? He said, she throws in right now. It's delicious. And we've got this like ume brine. And I was like, okay, fine. You know, and, just, right. and it just sort of like fell together, which is a really great way to lean into. Uh, I'm going to tackle both. Um, uh, what NA drink would you make for each season? Uh, and also, do you have set cocktail menus where you're constantly changing to accommodate the Ooh. ingredients from the farm kitchen? Uh, for that, that second question regarding... Um, the structure of our menus, the latter is definitely true uh, for us at least. I mean, we do have, you know, the way that it works at, at Stone Barns is, is, you know, is um, each cocktail is divided into what part of the farm it comes from. The, yeah, as you say, it's a little different. The apiary, the root cellar, et cetera. Yeah. But, but the, but the, it really depends on sort of like what, how you define the, the season, you know, I mean, in, in, you know, one year's spring is completely different from another year's spring. And because of that, the ingredients that you find are totally different. I mean, you know, we, we'll be, you know, uh, we, we will be waiting to put asparagus on the menu for, for weeks because it's just not ready yet. You know, whereas, you know, a lot and of And then the, when it's actually on the menu, it just lasts forever. Exactly. <laughs> and people are like, wow, I mean, I thought we were kind of done with this asparagus because they were going yet. everywhere else. Yeah. And, and so, you know, it, it's, uh, so, so there's no set time that we would keep cocktails on the menu, but, but it's, it's basically having access to someone that, I mean, you know, so to speak, has their ear on the ground for how long you have for each, uh, for each, uh, each ingredient. Um, as so far that's, as, that's where the farmers come into play. Exactly. Yeah. It's, 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 you know, super necessary. Um, uh, sure. Oh, the, the, the fresh hot blossom. That's, so that's another sort of like, if you want to think about, um, uh, so this is a question, um, you know, maybe not beer, but would you use fresh blooming hops? Uh, yes. And that's a great, I mean, yeah, hops are an amazing, you know, and very strong. Garnish as an infusion. Oh, they're a great garnish because oh. there's such a strong aroma, you know, and you can like toast it a little bit to oh. like let it out there. But then you want like a toaster oven on the bar, you know. Uh, ne next year, we'll be uh, but <laughs> You're asking yeah. too much now. You're making and, snacks and, too far. And that's, another, um, and that's another sort of, you know, way to think about, a way to approach each ingredient is that, you know, not only, so sure, we can get hops, but also we can get hops when they're at the, the exact same time, of the, the, the right time of year when they're, when they're blooming and they're sort of releasing that flavor. Um, and then there are so many different ways to incorporate it into the cocktail. I mean, you could turn it into a syrup, you could infuse it into the spirit, or you could just have it as a garnish. I mean, it, it, it plays perfectly well in, in all of those um, right. in all those parts. Answer the Olivia Patrick. All right. What are your favorite regional spirit blends? Okay. Yeah. So great question. So what, what are your favorite regional spirits brands? I mean, uh, I will just start rattling them off, I guess. Uh, Never Sink Gin. Um, is a huge, you know, we're huge fans of them. Yeah. They're just really amazing gin, uh, even, but, but as well as apple brandy, that pear brandy is delicious. Um, you know, and then they have some other stuff that I haven't seen in a while. Yeah, it's like a Pomo style. Oh, Pomo. Yeah. yeah. It's, so it's like an apple brandy, apple cider combination kind of thing that just like yeah. refrigerated at the end of a meal or something is just absolutely delicious. Beautiful. Nice also, like dessert wine style. Also really great mixed into a stirred gin cocktail. Yeah, really nice there. Look at that inside scoop um, right there. 
so yeah, never sync is really good. Um, you know, I, uh, I mean, any of the, you know, I, I feel like at our bar program and I think at any cocktail program, uh, we try to support local, Naturally, we try to support, yeah. um, and obviously we're not going to get mezcal or tequila or scotch local, Yeah, you know, uh, but we That's also try okay to, to have five different gins, but like one or two mezcal. You know? <laughs> I sense that he likes gin instead of uh, the mezcal and tequila. I, I love tequila yeah, and mezcal. Yeah. I also love gin. There's, yeah. there's plenty. So there's the wife and then there's, there's the other lady. Yeah. Uh, I'm, in, I'm into all of it. Um, but I say like to really support the small businesses if it's not supporting local. Sure, you know? sure. Um, and I'd like to answer the question that led to the whey being used in cocktails. Uh, I love using yeah. whey in cocktails, but um, the funny thing is that I'm lactose intolerant. <laughs> Um, but for some the reason, sacrifice that we all that we yeah, have to make yeah. sometimes. But it's funny because the milk doesn't affect me as much as the whey. Hmm. It's it's something. No, sorry, the so, whey doesn't affect me as much as the milk. It's a what fat I, compound. What I found with whey uh, in a cocktail is that it uh, it does it does a really great job of um, sort of lifting the cocktail. I don't necessarily. No, like, it has a lot of viscosity. Too. Yeah, exactly. Like, so like, like shaking it into a cocktail and oh, agitating it, like dispersing it totally, in that way, totally. sort of just it fluffs in, it up exactly, and just yeah. like really improves the mouthfeel in a really beautiful milk way. Milk punch. My oh, I mean, favorite, yeah, that, of course, that's a huge cocktail. part of yeah. cocktails is 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 the milk punch, which is basically. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's a, a clarified cocktail. Um, okay, I that think is, we have one. We have time for more one more second, question. The last yeah. question. We're going to go with we're, yes. We're going. The last question we're going to answer is any tips on making bitters. And you, we have told you how to make infused uh, spirits, and therefore we have also taught you how to make bitters. Uh, now we, there is a big sort of conversation between are you making bitters or are you making a tincture? And it's sort of like are you making tea or are you making a dried mint infusion? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Thank you. Um, the, <laughs> with so a bit bitters specifically references um, a tincture that's made out of a particular group of roots that have bitter qualities to it, and you know, starting with Angostura bitters, Inchona, gentian, um, so on and so forth. But I think those two are the main. Those are the two main ones, yeah. right? So you know, it's so uh, uh, basically. Um, you're using bitters in a much smaller quantity than you would be using an infused spirit. So you want to go with something that has a much higher alcoholic uh, content. We're talking like Everclear or something, you know, very, very high quality like that, uh, high quality, high quantity like that. So that, um, you know, when you're sort of adding your, basically your, your liquid spice, um, uh, then, then, you know, a little bit goes a long way. Stay away from fire. You do want to say that's that's also yeah that's not great but but uh, a great thing to do is you know if you sort of and this is something that we would do all the time you know if we had like cucumber skins or or, or licorice root or something like that yeah just you know stick some Everclear in it and let it sit for like four weeks just forget about it and then yeah, one exactly. day I'm like oh what is that uh, really quick that. two books that you would recommend and then we're done okay um, so I'll give my two okay so, so my two books would be I not say mine. Yeah, okay, I, I'm definitely not going to say yours. Um, I'm going to give, uh, so uh, there's a cocktail. I don't know. Man. Okay, I'm going to go I, first. I'm going to go okay, first. Okay, sure, please. Uh, for the standard bartender to like get started and be introduced into everything, uh, there's a couple, but my favorite is Jim Meehan's uh, Bartender's Manual. It's a, a green book. It's beautiful. Uh, it gives you all the information about uh, what, how to run your own bar, who are the people to know in the industry, and uh, all your classic cocktails that you need to know. And then my other favorite, um, and I, again, I have like 40 books and I have right. to pick my two, um, would be uh, Tiki style cocktails focused uh, and it's called Smuggler's Cove. Smuggler's um, Cove. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna classic. go with those two. Okay, yeah, I mean, I guess I'll go with the, um, either the PDT cookbook or okay. the, um, uh, what's that other one? Um, Since you were doing an NA, Zero, zero. Zero. Yeah. I mean, classic, but you know, but, but so, but these are like cocktail cookbooks, you know, I, I think that, um, sort of the best way I, I, okay. I'm, I'm, uh, my answer is a very intense and un, uh, and difficult to approach book called liquid intelligence, which basically tells you, you it tells you how to clarify things and how to infuse things and all it's basically a book all on techniques. Yeah. And in the same way that you're going, that you would buy the, uh, you know, the EMP cookbook, you're not going to make everything in there. 
but you're, it'll give it'll broaden your horizons and show you the mm -hmm. possibilities of what you can do. Very scientific. And, and then book. and then just read regular cookbooks, you know, and, yeah. and, and get inspiration from there. You know, there are so many different ways to do it. And of as always, you can always follow Julie and I in our <laughs> botanical beverages class, and we will continue to show you the world of drinks. We'll and try. We're, we'll and try. we're very excited about it. <laughs> Um, I'm sorry if we've run over, but we're really, really, yeah. really excited. And we're really thankful to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Um, and we hope you'll join us soon. Tomorrow. Yeah. No, tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yeah, we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>